All right. Welcome, folks, and thank you so much for joining us for the final episode in this web webinar series on regrowing agriculture. My name is Evan Bonus. I'm a postdoctoral researcher with the Food and Agriculture Institute at the University of the Fraser Valley on the unceded territory of the Stalo peoples. And I'm a recent graduate from the Institute for Resources, Environments, and Sustainability at UBC. So to start, I want to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver campus is located on the traditional, ancestral, unceded, and never surrendered territory of the Musqueam people. Myself, and likely many of you joining for today's conversation, are uninvited guests as part of an ongoing occupation of lands which have been under the stewardship of Indigenous people since time immemorial. If you don't know in which territories you're currently located, a good place to start is native-land.ca. Um, so please reflect on the lands on which you currently reside. Think to yourself, maybe do you feel that your relationship with these lands carry responsibilities? If so, to whom or to what? And you feel that you're carrying those responsibilities out with care. So thinking about land and territory is a good segue for today's topic. So thanks again for joining us for this final installment of the Farm to Globe Transforming Our Food Systems webinar series discussing the critical need for food systems transformation. The series looks at some of the pressing issues related to food and agriculture, including a focus on the social inequalities in the food system from Farm to Globe. The series is presented by the Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC Farm, sponsored by the RBC Royal Bank and in partnership with the UBC Faculty of Land and Food Systems and the BC Food Web. The Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC Farm is a teaching and research center and is a local to global food hub working on building more sustainable food systems. The BC Food Web is a web portal which makes research and resource materials widely accessible and facilitates collaboration between farmers and researchers. And the Faculty of Land and Food Systems is a world leader in research and teaching about sustainable and healthy foods and lands. Today our topic is regrowing agriculture and we're super lucky and I'm delighted that we're joined by Abra Grin and Sarah Dent. Our panelists will be discussing how to support agricultural transitions guided by principles of diversity, ecology, justice, and well-being for the people and planet. A few housekeeping items after each panelist gives a brief presentation. We'll move on to a Q&A discussion. So if you have questions for the panelists, please navigate to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom panel. You can share those with us. You can also feel free to upvote questions that appear in the chat by clicking on the thumbs up symbol. And if you want the opportunity to chat with other attendees, the chat feature will be available, except I just want to remind everyone that inappropriate or offensive comments won't be tolerated and you'll be immediately removed from the webinar. And lastly, I just want to ask that you bear with us if there are any unexpected technical difficulties or distractions. Now on to the speakers. So first up, we have Sarah Dent. Sarah is a photographer, public speaker, health coach, and professional farm wrangler. She has over 20 years of experience working in the charitable sector, developing programs, fundraising, building community, and acting as an agent of change, as well as 15 years of knowledge and experience in ecological agriculture and food systems. For the past decade, with a team of collaborators, she's grown a farmer to farmer educational resource network for young and for new and young agroecological farmers called Young Agrarians. As a systems thinker, her work is diverse. She has a very deep love for photographing farms, food and ecology. She's fascinated by the intersection between the land and the body, soul, soil and gut health. Uh, Sarah believes that in order to rebuild broken ecologies, we need to grow social ecologies to nurture our communities, to regenerate our ecosystems. She dreams of a world where ecology is at the heart of modern culture and through the regeneration of our food ecosystems, we can potentiate. So take it away, Sarah. Hi, thank you so much, Evan, for having me today. And uh, it's, it's great to be here. It's an honor to be able to speak. Um, I'd like to just start by um, taking actually a deep breath because I always get a little excited about being able to um, speak with groups. And while we're not all together experientially uh, in the same room together, we're able to share this space together virtually. So I'm gonna take a deep breath in and invite you all to take a breath with me. Mm. 
And I'm going to say my gratitude for being here today on Kla'aman territory and uh, for this lands, for these lands that support us, for uh, the trees and air and for the water, the oceans, the forests, the creatures and the people who have been here and continue to be here for time immemorial. Uh, immemori uh, <laughs> um, and uh, the area that I live in is colonially titled uh, Powell River, BC. And um, I'm grateful to be here and build relationships with the land and the people of this place. So I'm the co-founder of Young Agrarians, a network for new and young ecological farmers. Um, I'll be sharing for the next uh, 12 minutes or so about the work that we're doing uh, with the organization. Um, we're the largest network uh, in the country for a demographic of uh, food growers that are coming to the land because of their values and their desire to grow ecological foods and support their community with fresh and local food. Uh, we offer farmer to farmer programming to grow the next generation of farmers. This is a, a very important piece around how we're building and supporting inclusive communities is that our programming works to uh, support and provide services directly to farmers, by farmers as much as possible. We're trying to build the capacity and leadership uh, to support a new generation coming onto the land, uh, dealing with today's challenges uh, to grow food and make a living. Currently, our program delivery is Western Canada focused. We have programs from BC to Manitoba. We have had activities and events um, at the grassroots level that have happened uh, across the country. So we're really excited for all the farmers and organizations that we've been able to work with and partner with over the years. Uh, this is a great uh, collage of some of the farmers in our network and um, the different inspiring people who have been brave and courageous enough to focus on making farming uh, their livelihood and uh, have been part of uh, building the Young Agrarians Network in the places and geographies and uh, lands that they live on and occupy. Um, and uh, we also have uh, farmers that we work with that are Indigenous to the places that they work and farm. And we're honoured to be able to work with uh, many different people coming from many different backgrounds and many walks of life um, who are getting into uh, farming and looking for other people who are growing food and farming and um, working through the challenges of um, being in startup and um, going through that learning journey. And the peer network is like a gift that just keeps giving um, as people continue year over year and continue to build in and invest in relationships uh, that many of which have blossomed and started through uh, young agrarians activities. So why are we doing the work that we're doing? What's the mission that we're on? And, and why did, uh, you know, basically why does young agrarians exist? Um, back in, I think like 1930s context, about a third of people uh, in Canada were farming and because of the industrialization of our food systems and our lands, um, it's estimated that about 1.7% of the Canadian population now farms. So we have a very small percentage of total population that are growing food. And of that 1.7%, 9% in, of farmers are 35 and younger. Um, so the estimate there is that around 25,000 uh, people that live in Canada are operating farms are 35 and younger. So we have what we would call a crisis in um, farm transition um, in these lands that we can colonially call uh, Canada. Um, and as the cost of farming, the cost of land and the cost of infrastructure increases, the number of young people that have been able to get in and farm has decreased significantly. 
So the work that we're doing is to support new farmers to access education, training, land, business mentorships, community, and resources so that we're putting like a incubator around this new generation that are getting into farming so that they can um, get on their feet and hopefully uh, find viability. We also have uh, what's important here is we have market failure conditions for agriculture, whereby the cost of land and production mean, especially in places like Southern BC where the land base is so expensive, um, it basically means that you can't pay for land and infrastructure farming in 2021 in uh, most of southern British Columbia. So um, with that context and uh, with um, if you look at the National Farmers Union reports with the uh, total uh, farm debt in Canada exceeding farm revenues, we have market failure conditions for primary production overall. But the reality is, is that we're going to need to continue to be able to eat uh, as long as we are here and um, we're going to need people to grow food and farm. So these programs have shaped up over the last uh, decade of work. And um, there are five main program pillars currently. And so we like to say, we like to gather our people online and then we get like to get them together in real time on and off farms so that we can build community build relationships and we do that through our introduction circles at events and um, we've had something like over 14,000 people now through Young Agrarians events and we focus on that social networking as the tool by which to create the spark that allows for relationships to grow and we've seen areas where um, even young farmers living on the same block didn't know each other and uh, now uh, many of those connections have been made and we've been able to network up quite a bit of Western Canada through Young Agrarians events and through events with many of our different uh, collaborating organizational partners. Um, in the Prairies, we offer an apprenticeship training program um, in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba in regenerative agriculture and the focus is to get new and young people onto farms so that they can learn the hands-on skills to run and manage farms and get mentorship from their hosts. Um, and then we do quite a bit of work around land access and transition. Uh, we offer a land match matching program in BC, and we've just gotten some startup dollars to start working in Alberta, which is really awesome. As well, we provide a business mentorship program, which is a farmer to farmer uh, mentorship, um, supporting new farms in startup in British Columbia. So the farmers that we work with um, are working very, very hard. Um, many of them uh, work seven days a week. Uh, they work uh, anywhere from like eight to 16 hour days. I, I actually don't know a ton that are working just eight hours a day. And the work that they're doing through the ecological farming that is uh, driving them um, to get into farming in the first place works to regenerate soils and ecosystems. Um, we know that through regenerative agriculture practices, uh, farms can adapt to climate change, um, not using the word mitigate much anymore because right now with uh, climate change uh, moving as fast as it is, uh, adaptation is the main focus to support farms to get as resilient as possible in the face of increased wildfires and flooding. So adaptation. Our farmers are working to build food systems resiliency, and uh, some people are working with this concept of food sovereignty, which we support. Uh, our farmers are working to revitalize rural and urban communities through growing local economies, the multiplier effect of keeping dollars in community by buying local, supporting local, um, shortening uh, transportation uh, to access food. Um, our farms, as they're growing, are able to provide jobs and training to other farms. I like to say that farmers grow farmers. Um, and uh, it's very important as we move into increased climate change that we are really supporting our local food economies through direct markets and short supply chains. And that is what our amazing new and young ecological farmers are doing and providing and growing in their communities. 
So in 2020, Young Agrarians had the privilege to work with, uh, our estimate is 1,400 farmers, uh, representing approximately 850 farms. We estimate we worked with 500 landowners and around 200 organizations to do the program work that we do. This is our BC land matching program, um, which has been really exciting to watch this program take off. It, it's adapted from a Quebec uh, land matching program called Arter. And to date, we've made 161 land matches on over 6,220 acres in British Columbia. And uh, the program is available today. Uh, the main email is land at youngergrace.org. And we work to basically um, support landowners to develop their vision um, and assess their properties uh, for viability for farming and match up new and young farmers to these properties and help them form uh, lease agreements as well as get enterprise ready to start their new farm businesses. And this is the excitement of the program is taking bare soil um, land that uh, has been cleared for agriculture um, and then having it uh, actually growing food after matching up with a new farmer through our program. Um, some of the other work that we're doing through the land matching program is creating more tools to help people imagine what the uh, transition will be for the land, like um, be because land is so expensive how can that land actually transition to next generation since we have something called the BC Transition Toolkit for a non-family farm transfer. Uh, it's estimated that about two thirds of new farmers in Canada are not coming from family farm backgrounds. And so there's a lot of um, tax policy and work that's focused on family farm transfer. Um, but a lot of the farmers we're working for, with are not coming from that family farm background. So we're trying to support them with tools to do things like form cooperatives and uh, imagine other types of ways that they can um, transition land through uh, shared ownership structures. This is a photo from our Prairie's Apprenticeship Program, which will continue to grow into 2022. We'll be doing a big call out for applicants. Uh, if you know people in the prairies that are interested in farming, this is a great program getting people onto farms. We work with all sorts of different types of farms from grain farms to uh, holistically managed farms to vegetable production. Um, and so it's a great uh, training opportunity for young people wanting to get onto the land and, and try farming. These are some of our uh, amazing funders. Uh, many of them are perennial funders that have been involved with the network over the last several years that we're extremely grateful for their support in the work that we're doing. And um, it's been a great honor to uh, tell you all about the programming that Young Agrarians is doing. We invite you all to join us, come out to our events um, and connect with us. Uh, and yeah, we're really, you know, despite climate change and all the challenges that we're facing, we will continue to do this work in the food system to support a new generation of ecological food growers to grow food in all the myriad of ways that we need people engaging with and supporting our local food supply. So thank you so much for your time today and uh, really excited to hear from Abra uh, and about the work that she's doing. Thanks so much for that terrific presentation, Sarah. Um, moving along, next we have, I would like to introduce Abra Brin. Abra has worked closely with farmers on food systems for 30 years with a priority on food value chains and the regulatory regimes that impede or support them. In 2012, Abra began integrating fisheries into the scope of her work, recognizing the vital role that fisheries play in the vibrancy of marine ecosystems, communities, and the diets of people around the world. She works to lower the barriers, both regulatory and otherwise, for small and medium scale businesses to thrive in a place based food systems. Abra is a policy advisor at Farm Folk City Folk on their climate solutions program, and she's the executive director of the Central Kootenai Food Policy Council. So take it away. Abra. So, Evan, some, oh, good. Someone's bringing up my slides. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for this, the invitation to join you today and um, for the opportunity to share some of our work. So as Evan indicated, I am working with Farm Folk City Folk. Farm Folk City Folk has been working to inspire and equip people to eat food that nourishes themselves and the planet since 1993. We're BC's oldest and largest food and agricultural charitable nonprofit organization. Our work includes the BC Seed Security Program, which is really critical at this point, climate solutions, equally important, and initiatives that strengthen community-supported agriculture, amongst others. I myself have been working with Farm Folk City Folk since early 2020 as a policy advisor for the Climate Solutions Program. For today's event, I was asked to speak about my work as a food systems advocate and policy advisor, so I'm going to go back a bit before my time with Farm Folk City Folk and then wrap up with Farm Folk City Folk. Next slide, please. So my commitment to work on food systems was birthed on the farm where I grew up in Vernon's BX district. We had a small tree fruit orchard and were part of a local food hub called the Vernon Fruit Union, long before the term food hub was known. They provided bins for fruit, controlled atmosphere storage and marketing for our harvest, and a small grocery store where local fruit was always on offer. We were part of an agricultural economy that included sectors for which that include included all the sectors for which BC is justly famous: dairy, ground crops, grain, livestock, berries, and more. The critical mass of farmers meant it was easy to access equipment, veterinarians, abattoirs, processing plants, and other key links in our supply chains. Both my parents grew up on farms on the prairies during the so-called Great Depression of the 1930s, and so our household practice was to grow and raise most of our own food needs for my family of 13. We had a huge garden and access to all the fruit we could possibly need. We also raised our own beef and had ready access to chickens and eggs from my grandparents' homestead. Milk was delivered to our farmhouse door. That was the 1960s and 70s. Next slide, please. By the 1980s, international trade agreements and the explosion of agriculture in Washington state, just south of us following the damming of the Columbia River, resulted in a steady decline in farms and businesses that support them across the Okanagan Valley and throughout the province. There were no more jobs for teenagers at the local ice cream plant because there was far less local milk. The flash freezers had all disappeared. The fruit union cooperative folded and the real estate sold and a strip mall now sits where the massive storage facility used to be located. Orchard after orchard was clear cut, making way for sometimes grapes, but more often rows of houses where rows of trees used to stand. These, were, these losses were and continue to be very personal for me. These are not just statistics and historical facts, but the shredding of food sheds I once knew well and participated in. Next slide, please. In 1990, I moved to the Kootenays and began working at the Kootenay Co-op in Nelson, some of you will know it. I saw immediately that there was an urgent need for information about food systems. I was answering questions about what organic meant, how to connect with and support local farmers. At that time, farmers in various pockets around the province were starting to organize to provide local certification to distinguish bona fide organic producers from others. I determined that if I was attempting to advocate for farmers at the co-op, both with our internal decision makers, but also with the customers, then I needed to have a closer connection to the farmers of the area. So I began attending meetings of the fledgling Kootenai Organic Growers. It became immediately apparent that I had something to offer the group, namely my laptop and ability to take minutes and create documents. They were very short um, skilled in that area. Through various projects, I helped to create our area's first farm, farm guide. We organized farm tours, guides for farmers seeking to sell to retailers, and the seasonal produce guide you see on the slide. Our efforts look very rudimentary now, but this was in the very early days of the internet and desktop publishing, a time when goofy stick people running across web pages was the hip thing to do. I was also writing letters on behalf of the group to the Ministry of Environment to try to stop pesticide spraying on or near their farms and exploring what genetic engineering meant in the context of organic agriculture, ecosystems, and the food we consume. It wasn't all that clear in 1996, but that threw me deeply into food activism. Next slide, please. 
My food activism soon led me to the understanding that as much as my sparsely populated region barely registers in, for instance, elections such as we're having right now and around the tables of decision makers, nevertheless, those decisions taken far away were having an impact on what and how our area farmers could raise food. It also taught me that there is a whole ecosystem of policy, layers of government, siloed agencies, and a whole lot of people who care passionately. Next slide, please. I also realized that if bad policy can wreak such havoc, surely good policy can do the opposite. They're, they are two sides of the same coin. So I dove into learning how to be more effective as a sustainable food systems advocate. I did not want to continue jumping up and down outside the door, but rather be in the room, putting forward the case and different options for a better way to nourish ourselves and support those who provide our food. Next slide, please. In 2000, I left the Kootenai Co-op staff to work alongside Kathleen Neen on a province-wide two-year food security project that helped to form relationships and a broader understanding of what the strengths and needs of communities were across the province when it came to feeding all their residents well. It also was early days of the BC Food Systems Network and really helped us connect and understand each other across the province. Since then, I've been very fortunate to have a series of long and short-term contracts that have supported my activism habit and also served to deepen my understanding of how to effectively advocate to and work with government. So on this slide, you'll see some of the initiatives I've been involved with. Uh, the toolkit for working with local government on food policy was relatively recent. I worked in the boundary region of the province on helping support their, moods, their, feet, their meat sector. You'll see I've also worked on fisheries. And one of the first big reports I was involved in was the agricultural plan in the central Kootenai that I'm proud to say still guides their work. Next slide, please. In April 2020, when I joined Farm Folk City Folk as a food policy advisor, my first job was to coordinate a coalition of which Sarah and Young Agrarians was a member to draft an open letter to the Premier and the Minister of Agriculture on responding to the pandemic in a way that addressed the immediate and long-term food security needs of communities across the province. And I'm proud to say we also include, included fisheries uh, in this initiative. Farm Folk City Folk is a founding, members of farmer, a founding member of Farmers for Climate Solutions and I joined their policy working group. Farmers for Climate Solutions has produced two key and influential documents directed at the federal government. One on a climate focused response to the pandemic's impact on farmers and a more recent one, a second one focused on the 2021 federal budget which was uh, released last December. That report recommended a set of high impact programs to be rolled out on farms across the province, across the country. This report was very successful in that the recommendations were referenced in the throne speech and then included in the federal budget earlier this year. Some of you will be aware of the On Farm Climate Action Fund that is currently out and with submissions for um, people to actually implement the program. And it's a direct result of that report and Farmers for Climate Solutions very active work with the federal government. Here in BC, we continue to engage with the provincial government on how farmers are experiencing the impacts of climate change and what priorities they have in order to play their part in reducing GHG emissions. We held a series of focus groups um, by sector earlier this year, and it was incredibly informative and really humbling to listen to how hard farmers are working both to adapt to the impacts, but also do their part in addressing climate change. By the end of 2021, we'll have produced two white papers, the first of which you see on this slide, which is a high level piece that focuses on the role that agriculture needs to play in addressing the climate crisis. In BC, the climate um, action plans have mostly focused on all the other sectors and not agriculture because it's admittedly a small portion of our GHG emissions in the province. But agriculture needs to play a role, must play a role. And if we don't, then our percentage of the emissions are gonna go out. So we'll be producing a second, go up, I mean, uh, we're gonna be producing a second white paper by the end of this year. It's currently in develop and will include more sector and regionally specific recommendations because we recognize that what happens in the Fraser Valley is very different than how it plays out in the Caribou and in the Peace. 
and what you need to do on a grain farm or a tree fruit farm is really different than um, intensive livestock production as an example. So our recommendations will be based on that information and as always with, in collaboration with others who are involved in, in our work so that they're well grounded and will serve the dual goals of sustainable farms and addressing the climate crisis. Next slide, please. I grew up in Seelks territory and went to a Catholic elementary school along with kids from the local reserve. As an adult, I've taken responsibility for my own learning journey about what it means to be a settler Canadian and also to better understand the impact of colonialism on the first peoples of Turtle Island. I spent my life involved with farmers and farming as I've just talked about, particularly with organic farmers who generally have a deep commitment to the land and to steward, stewarding the ecosystem with which they live and work. Parallel to, the, to that journey, I have deepened my skills as a policy advocate, but I've become more and more uncomfortable with the fact that I'm working to improve a colonial governance system that has done terrible things and continues to do terrible things to the people and places that were here long before any settlers. It is a fact that agriculture has been one of the most effective tools for removing and restricting access by Indigenous peoples to their land and the places that sustain their lives, cultures, and languages. I did not do a land acknowledgement at the beginning of my presentation, but I fully acknowledge that I live and work on land that is unseated. And despite our fee simple approach to land ownership that is a transplant from the legal systems of Europe, the land belongs to the Sinaiks, the Seahawks the Tanaha, the Tsleil-Waututh, and so many other nations in this place commonly called British Columbia. So I wanna wrap up my talk with a reflection on the theme of this series, transforming food systems. What are we transforming and into what? The image on the left of the screen is farmland in Southern Saskatchewan. You'll see it's all cut up and all fully cultivated. It used to be very different. The image on the right is of an indigenous fish harvester in the Hazeltons. If we truly want to transform our food systems, we have to include fish and we need to follow the lead of those who are connected to land and water, those who are stewarded it from time immemorial. When Europeans stumbled upon Turtle Island, they encountered indigenous people who were among the tallest on the planet at the time, a, foot, a full foot taller than most Europeans. This is almost certainly from a long history and deep skills connected to the land and the waters that enabled them to thrive. This is the kind of knowledge and their leadership is absolutely necessary to truly fully transform our food systems, to restore plant balance to the planet, to reverse the terrible trends and harm from climate change, halt the mass extinction of species on the planet and be well nourished, all beings, not just humans. There's a common saying in large scale agriculture circles in Canada that we feed the world. My personal belief, it's deeply colonial and patriarchal and how we are feeding the world is clearly causing a lot of harm. We need to be more humble and look to the wisdom of indigenous peoples and enable sustainable food systems, both indigenous and genuinely sustainable settler food options to nourish us all well. Thank you very much for your time today and I look forward to questions. Thanks so much for that stellar presentation, Abra. Um, okay, now it's time to move on to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, so I'll be asking our panelists some, some curated questions as well as any live audience questions you receive. Reminder to navigate to the Zoom control panel, select the Q&A, and uh, you can put your questions in there. You can also upvote others' questions. Um, so um, I guess we'll start by asking uh, this first question to Sarah. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about how the Young Agrarians um, uh, deals with the high cost of land. Um, so in general, you know, how do we grow agriculture in BC with this significant barrier? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the statistics we've seen are that half of farm operators in Canada, 35 and younger, are leasing land. And so the BC land matching program, the land matching work that we're doing, we're mostly working people with people so that they can access uh, land through leasing arrangements so that they don't actually have to purchase it. And given how expensive the land base is and the land market and the revenues that people can make off of agriculture, um, it can be very difficult to make the business case for actually acquiring the land um, unless people already have equity, uh, family support, um, an investor, uh, basically access the capital to purchase. Um, so uh, most of our work is, we're not, you know, really in the business of helping people to acquire land. If they're lucky enough to do that, uh, great. Um, but we work with people to try and help them create stable long-term uh, leasing arrangements on land to farm. That, that's great. Just as a follow up, I guess the the stable long term lease is that aspect of it's incredibly important here, especially for agroecological farmers who invest a lot in you know long term viability of the soil and, and ecosystem health. How, how what's what's like a stable long term lease? Like what's a what's a what do, what do you what's the objective for lease terms? Um, well, it really depends on both the landowner and the person coming onto the farm, what their needs are and where they're at. Like a new farmer in their farming journey might not be ready to sign up for a 10-year or a 20-year lease agreement. Um, they might be looking for something shorter if they're basically starting their first farm business and they want to uh, see how things grow. So we work on lease arrangements that are anywhere from a year to 25 years in length, just depending on um, where the farmer is at and where the landowner is at. Um, but uh, obviously the longer the better. Um, and so we do see some of those types of leases come up, um, but there are many different considerations in place when people are leasing. Thanks, that's, that's super helpful and interesting and it's a great approach to a very big challenge. Mm -hmm. um, Average, did you wanna add anything on that topic of land access and the cost of land in the province? It's certainly a challenging one and Sarah knows it very well. Um, there's, there are, I mean, it's, it's complicated and depends on, how, on what agenda you're approaching it. So if it's about getting farmers on the land, there's all kinds of great models about ways to share the land and tax incentives to get those who own it to enable people to come on it. And um, Sarah's rightly identified that um, new farmers may not be ready for a longer term lease, but for those who seek to build the soil and um, and enable uh, diverse kinds of agriculture that is sustainable and ecological, it's a huge investment of effort and time and resources. And so a longer term lease is vitally important. And ultimately, if those leases could actually be a lease to own arrangement, that would be the ideal scenario. There's very few who are willing to extract themselves from the market valuing of land and make land access more equitable and fair to the next generation but it does happen not often enough it does happen but um i also have the privilege of working with farmers for climate solutions on their equity project with a, a small group of really wise advisors and the issue of um land access and um that we have ultimately built the agricultural food systems of on of north america on stealing land from indigenous people and on the labor of, a, of black people and a lot of other people of color, there's huge justice issues attached to who has access to land that continue to marginalize a lot of people. And so when you look at agriculture and who's farming these days across the country, it's mostly white, it's mostly men. And we need to do a lot more work to ensure that whatever programs we have that enable the access address um, diversity, equity, justice, bring on more voices, more diversity, and ultimately the beauty of different foods and foods that adapt better to our changing climate. Thanks so much for that. That's actually a great segue um, to a follow-up question that's been posted. Um, I'm going to read this one verbatim. 
So when we talk about land use and land availability, my mind immediately goes to redistribution and indigenous reconciliation. How do we create a thriving agricultural system, but also a decolonized one? And um, either of you can speak first. Well, to hear from both. Well, I just saw Kukstam from Tiffany um, very kindly in the chat. And I would say, ultimately, if we're actually going to do that, we have to get the heck out of the way and look to Indigenous leaders to tell us how that needs to happen. Um, it's really hard to start the conversation of, for those of us in this framework of fee simple ownership of land, because it's scary. It means we have to give things up but there's so much we could do. There's voluntary taxes that are made available to indigenous people to help with bringing them up and giving them the resources to be able to have a voice and be able to put proposals forward. I am constantly humbled by the generosity of so many indigenous people who don't say, get the heck off this continent. Um, and I would think that's an entirely legitimate request, but personally, I wouldn't know where to go. And so the ways that we can find to be utterly respectful, but humble in looking to Indigenous leadership about what does land justice look like, I think is a really important part of this journey. And I think part of the other complexity of the conversation is people tend to freak out about, well, well then we won't have enough food. You know, if we're going back, if they think that it's all about going back to earlier times, peasants, no more, no more internet, that kind of silly stuff. And that's not what anybody's asking in this 21st century. But there's this mythology of we feed the world, as I said earlier, that mass production of commodities is actually how the world is nourished. And there's ample evidence. I mean, Indigenous people know how to live on the land with in balance and secure their needs from that land base. Many of them still hold that knowledge. It's there in their stories, in their songs, in how they in in the the language, and. Also, there's ample evidence peasant farmers and fishers around the world actually produce the vast majority of the food that truly nourishes people. So we have to get out of this obsession with commodity production because there's a myth attached to, to commodity production that it's what nourishes us. It's what creates well, mostly derivatives. Some of it goes into industrial use. Some of it goes into Coca-Cola. Like that's not food. So if we can extract ourselves from the common practice and notion of what nourishes us, I think we have a better um, opportunity to walk that journey with Indigenous leaders about how do we all share this space in a way that is just and that nourishes us well, all beings, not just humans. Thanks so much, Sarah. Sarah want to follow up on that? Yeah, thanks, Abra. Um, I. I often say that we're paying for colonization, like the market failure conditions, the fact that young people can't just go out and access land, like we're literally paying for the colonization that started 100, 500 years ago with the market prices that we have for land. We're, we're not entitled to the land as settlers. And um, I'm seeing a lot more new and young farmers uh, learning about whose land that they're on um, and working to build relationships with the um, First Nations and the places where they are. And, you know, we, I think as a society, it's continuing to support First Nation land title, um, doing the decolonization work, uh, the anti-oppression work, the anti-racism work, and figuring out how to show up at the table and how to listen. And, and as Abra's saying, like, you know, um, following the leadership of the Indigenous communities in the places uh, where we are and where we're lucky enough to um, live, work, and grow food. Um, so uh, I think back to that relationship building piece, um, for me, it's uh, building relationships, supporting relationships, uh, supporting resources um, to be there for um, uh, indigenous farmers and um, uh, making sure that it's coming from a place of uh, listening and supporting and um, not just trying to impose a way of agriculture or a kind of productionist model, um, but um, yeah, being part of that conversation and being part of the relationship building and um, 
um, yeah, I, I feel uh, like tears and pride thinking about the many different Indigenous people that are working, um, growing food, uh, supporting their communities, and um, uh, in the times that we're in and um, in the colonial state that we're existing in. So, yeah. Thank you both for your thoughts and reflections and um, on, on that important and challenging topic. Um, so that's that's great. Um, both, both of you hinted a little bit at some content for this next question, and that's about kind of a shift from industrial commodity food to different smaller scale, maybe um, farming. And I'm wondering, um, or this person who asked this question is wondering like, that sounds like a very big shift. Um, how, how are we gonna do that? How fast is this, is this possible? Can we do it in the timing that we might need to address some of the climate concerns and other ecological challenges we're facing? Can you folks speak to the prospects for a transition? This is like the biggest uh, thing that I think about every day when I start working is how do we operationalize the change? It's been decades of neoliberal policies to pull apart uh, small scale food systems. So rebuilding um, uh, all the different things that allow for thriving local and small scale food systems from um, storage to transportation to um, distribution networks. Uh, it's, we're, we're in an interesting moment here because there's quite a bit of investment going into these uh, community-based food hubs and more of an awareness around small scale food processing. We have a organization in BEC, the Small Scale Food Processors Association, who've been working on this issue for um, decades. And, uh, you know, things like the farmers markets. Um, and uh, I think, I'm not, can't quite remember the stat, Abra, but I think it's like over 70% of farms in BC fall into that small scale um, just because of the way our land base is. And so when I'm thinking about that operationalizing of change, it's really about having more and more people that are um, learning about food systems, learning about food, growing food, getting in touch with their farmers. Um, it, that is a big part of accelerating that change is continuing to invest in the small scale food systems that we have. And I believe that's where the transformation can be. And do we need to do it at scale? Yep. Do we have a very short window to do it in? Yep. <laughs> so I think that's where we can all participate in the food system is, um, you know, supporting the small scale and supporting the local and supporting the indigenous and supporting all um, the things that are happening in the areas where we live as part of hopefully um, being able to uh, scale up that change in the time frame that we have. Thanks for that. Abra, did you want to follow up? Well, I think Sarah's covered off quite well, and I know there's a number of uh, more questions, so I think I'll just leave it there. Great. Okay. Um, I, th there's an interesting question here. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you folks might approach it. Um, somebody asked, um, based on kind of what you've been we've been talking about today if there's one policy in agriculture that you could change um what would that be i tend to actually really resist questions about what's the one thing we've we've spent centuries uh, deconstructing and destroying indigenous ways and food systems and it's been a century of um, wreaking havoc on settler agriculture and food systems and so um, there is no one simple answer um, but to continue my earlier theme and to be a little bit pr provocative I'd say the one key policy I'd change is toss out the Indian Act and look to indigenous people to tell us what needs to be put in place. Nice. Great answer. Thank you for that. Sarah, did you have? <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Um, I've got another question that's on a slightly different topic now. Um, so labor shortages, immigration and immigration difficulties really came to the front 
before in the pan during the pandemic, and drew our attention to migrant workers um, who are a huge part of the food system here in Canada and the struggles that they face. Um, so how can we de develop a food system that's both just and fair for workers and for farmers? Do you want to go first, Sarah? Yeah, go. <laughs> um, this is an area uh, that I'm quite concerned about, but not one I have deep connections in. Um, but I really, I do know that most critically, we need to stop isolating the migrant farm workers. It's uh, unbelievably wrong to have them so isolated. They leave everything that's important and dear to them, their places, their families, their food, their culture, their language, their music, and they, their smells. And they move here to produce food because there aren't enough Canadian laborers to do it, or people willing to do it. And the isolation, you know, they fly here, they don't necessarily have a vehicle. And we stick them out in farms and then expect that they're gonna do well so the mental health, the physical well-being of people that work so hard in the crazy conditions that they're having to work in, every farmer is having to work in, is absolutely appalling. So breaking down that isolation, I think, is critically important. Um, and some of the mythology around migrant workers, that they need to be isolated because heaven knows they might come and do something terrible. That's so culturally wrong. Um, and ultimately, a pathway to citizenship is critically important that we offer to our migrant workers. If we're willing to use their bodies to grow our food, we should welcome them to this place. Um, yeah, and I, I would like, this is the complexity here is um, enormous because basically like, the United States has a ton of undocumented workers. Um, Canada has documented workers that come in. Um, one thing I don't know if many people know, but um, agriculture is exempt from minimum wage standards in many of the provinces. Um, so we have people that are coming into the country that are, are not even making a minimum wage standard in the agricultural um, like workspaces that they end up in. So um, uh, because of the market failure conditions for farming and the profit margins for primary production, um, you have these labor conditions where, um, you know, farms are basically having to exploit labor um, in order to produce primary foods. And so how are we going to, as a society um, that's, you know, basically developed uh, decades of dependency on cheap food, um, like change these things. Uh, farm labor should be at least minimum wage. And um, what Abra was talking about in terms of permanent residency, uh, farm workers that come here should have pathways to permanent residency. Um, I understand that there's a pilot program out now um, where there's uh, the beginnings of that from um, the federal government. Um, I haven't heard any success stories yet, um, but this removal of isolation and isolating conditions for people who are um, brave and courageous enough to come here and farm and um, work for the wages that uh, farms are setting, which are unfair, uh, unfortunately, and unjust because of um, the price points that people are selling uh, food at. Um, so there's many different uh, layers to this issue that um, in my mind, it's, you know, how do we move forward um, giving land, giving land, shouldn't, shouldn't even be giving land, it's returning land to, First Nations having people who are coming here working have access to permanent residency and good quality of work, having um, people who work on farms have a fair wage, and having that food being um, sold on the market for fair prices to farmers. It's all part of that um, shift in uh, the way we understand food and supply chains and access to them and who's working them. And often when I talk to people about food and they ask me like, should I be buying this organic or should, you know, what, what, what's the reason here, the rationale for going and spending all of this money on this food? It's often for me, it's yeah, sure. It's better for your health, but who's actually growing your food and is it going to be better for them? 
Are you gonna go and buy those greenhouse tomatoes? Do you know what's been sprayed on those tomatoes just because they're cheaper in the grocery store? So to me, it often boils down to the human rights of who's growing your food. And that's how I'm picking the food that I'm growing is what I know about the growing practices and the, the rights of the people growing it, the conditions for the animals, the conditions for um, the land. This is a, a huge part of um, the reimagining of our food system that's not predicated on violence and injustice um, for the people that are uh, working the land or for the land. So, or the rightful stewards of those lands. Oh, that's, a, I think, a really terrific kind of closing summary of a vision of a transformed food system, which has been the topic of this entire webinar series and also today. Um, I'll just offer you both the chance to say any concluding final thoughts, if you have anything that you want to share before we wrap up. I had, well, go ahead, Amber. <laughs> well, one other thing that in terms of the migrant worker piece um, that I wanted to add is even if we can only look at things from our own self-interest as uh, so-called Canadians, um, migrant workers bring incredible farm skills. And if ultimately we're struggling with a crisis of we don't have enough farmers, we've if we enable them and to bring their families and become Canadian citizens and got them on land they had control over. Um, it would be like we would be able to expand our pool of farmers incredibly. So I, as, as Sarah said, like we have a lot to do to reimagine our food systems. But I also think that, um, you know, we're still in the thick of this horrific global pandemic. And if nothing else, it's taught us that, you know, one of the questions, the other questions we haven't answered, there are ways to rapidly change um, how we live in community, what we have access to, what are our priorities, where there's political will. And that was actually one of the things I wanted to mention earlier, like where there is political will, it's often not hard to figure out what's the dream, what we'd like to see happen is getting the political will to make it happen which is why I can't ever um, extract myself from an activist um, drive in my life because it's creating the political will in the people and, and encouraging our leaders to listen, listen well and carefully and make the change. And uh, my concern is with the ongoing impacts of the climate crisis and the disruptions from the pandemic, as well as uh, all, the, all the needs for justice and land back, et cetera, we will not have a lot of choice soon. We are going to have to be much more careful and humble in our expectations about what nourishes us, how it's produced, who has access to it, and what um, what we can do to make sure everyone's properly nourished. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Sarah, did you want to have a final thought? Yeah, I, I think I have, uh, it's been an incredibly, you know, challenging period of time and um, that piece around reimagining and revisioning our food system, it's, it's something that I've been trying to bring into my daily practice is um, connecting with the land and uh, imagining the land a hundred years ago and understanding that if that political will is there, we can grow back our 500,000 year old, 1500 year old, we can grow back these spaces and places that we live in. And each and every one of us has a role to play in growing that resiliency and getting back into being connected with the land. And so I think that those relationships with each other, there's a lovely question about farmers and how independent they are uh, starting their own farm businesses and maybe not reaching out for hope. And I think that's a big part of why Young Agrarians has been focused on the community building aspect is just continuing to talk to each other, building community, building relationships and connecting back to the land in all of the myriad ways and spaces and places that we can and valuing the relationships with our neighbors and sharing food and um, you know, holding some kind of vision for what the future is. And um, I just keep, keep imagining the old growth forests and I keep imagining 
the strength that I see in the people that I meet and um, the beauty in, um, you know, being part of a, a vibrant food system and, you know, hoping and praying that um, we as a, a bigger system, as a society of all the people that are here are able to do that. We've never had a few food shortage issue. We've only ever had a few food distribution problem and we can grow enough and we can put life back into the land. And so it's up to all of us really to be part of that journey. So thank you so much for including me today. And uh, yeah, it's been great to be here. Well, thank you both for such an enriching uh, conversation. Um, I really enjoyed this. Um, and there's tons to talk about on this topic, obviously. And, and there's still some unanswered questions and stuff. But unfortunately, it's time to wrap up. Um, so thank you all for sharing your time with us. Please stay tuned uh, for a follow-up email, which will share some resources on some of the things that we covered today. And thanks especially to our pr presenters, Sarah Dent, Abra Brin. Um, behind the scenes, we'd like to also thank Melanie Cooksdorf, and um, Marid Norton and Julia Taylor. Um, the Center for Sustainable Food Systems also would like to know what you folks thought about the webinar. So you'll be directed to a short survey after the session ends. Um, also, if you have any other questions about CSFS or UBC, um, feel free to visit the ubcfarm.ubc.ca website. Uh, lastly, CSFS uh, would like to thank all attendees, speakers, moderators, and other folks involved in making this Farm to Globe series such a success. Um, though this is the series finale, CSFS, the UBC Farm, the Food Web, and the Faculty of Land and Food Systems will continue this conversation. So keep an eye out for future seminars and webinars. So thanks everyone and uh, see you around. <laughs>